Hello and welcome everyone to the Annuity Straight Talk podcast episode number 100. We made it, been talking about it for a while, and today is the day. The special, what, the century episode, something like that. I'm excited to be here and looking back, that is a lot of work that went into this. Uh, it's helped a lot of people. I'm really grateful for the feedback I've received, both good and bad. Makes me better, makes it worthwhile for me to do it. And a hundred now and going for a hundred more answering your questions, helping you with all the concerns that you face in retirement. I'm going to share my screen and show you guys the newsletter. And we're going to talk about for episode 100 misinformation on annuity.org, another website. I don't necessarily like to go after people, but I have to correct inaccuracies and I've got to do the best I can to make sure you guys get the straightest information possible. I'm not perfect. We all make mistakes, but this certainly goes beyond that. So I'm going to share with you the document where I've been working on this. And it's not on the posted yet, but you guys can refer to the newsletter for any links to other podcasts that might be associated with this that can clear things up, answer questions. For the 100th episode, I am going back to what got this whole thing started in the first place. Nearly 15 years ago, I started in the business in 2003 and, and 2008. It was the end of 2008. I decided to start a website because I had a bunch of research documented in uh, a written down. I had articles that I'd written, had no idea what to do with them. Met another person who said, hey, why don't you start a website? But the point of it was I was correcting inaccuracies and things I saw even as a young agent. I always scratched my head. Hey, you know what? That doesn't make sense. What about this or that? started testing ideas, challenging uh, the sales pitch, if you will. And again, I'd like to tell everybody in this business, I get pitched on new ideas or products as much as you do when you start signing up at different places on the internet. But my goal was to replace the sales pitch. So when I started, it was there was very little information available online. Now there's too much almost. Oh, I don't know who to believe, what I should trust. And so I'm trying to be the person that you can trust. Although I never ask for it, it's something I have to earn, but I'm out here online. All of my information can be verified, challenged by anyone, and it is at times. Now, I wasn't the first person to go online, but put compared to most of the stuff you can see today and find out today, I was well ahead of the majority of those people. And it frustrates me to no end to see a lack of people who are able to explain things simply and accurately. A lot of the stuff that you see online, in fact, most of it right now is produced by people who have no stake in your financial outcome. It's a third party organization. It's not necessarily the advisor. I'm the advisor who might sell you an annuity or might tell you not to buy an annuity. I'm the one producing this. I'm the one creating it. Every piece of it is mine. Positive or negative, you are likely to run into someone who will mi misrepresent what annuities can do. That's very important. It could be somebody who's hyped to sell an annuity or someone who thinks you should invest elsewhere. Everybody has a personal stake in it. I can say my objective is to make sure that you make good decisions. That's it. A lot of the worst stuff you'll see and the worst information comes from organizations, not advisors. Either financial publications that are sponsored by major investment institutions might give you the gray area explanation that's not the black and white. I believe in black and white. Gray area does have a place in certain scenarios, but you got to define the black and white first. So from the first 100 episodes, I've given you everything I can, as honest as I possibly can be. I've been challenged a few times. I either get to further clarify my point of view, or I get a chance to learn something, and that's always positive as well. So there's another website, one of these websites that's run by a marketing organization, not an advisor. What they're doing is it's annuity.org. Now, back when I started this website, we looked at different domain names. I settled on annuitystraighttalk.com. It was available for nine bucks. I did that. 
a lot of different ideas. Annuity.com was taken. Annuity FYI. I have uh, some respect for those guys uh, out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we've done some business in different areas. I think they do a pretty good job. Those guys have been around immediateannuities.com. Those people selling income annuities, a great group of guys out in New Jersey. They've been here since the late 90s, since before anybody else. So I was, I was well behind them and in front of a lot of other people. But what you're getting right now, and I know this, there's a number of places that do this. And they either do it for asset management or for insurance products. This one does it for an insurance products. But I remember looking at the domain names. And I think annuity.org was available. I'm not going to quote specifics on how it happened, but we were told that .org extensions on websites were more meant for, at the time, were more, more meant for nonprofit type people. Of course, we wanted to make a profit. We wanted to make money. And it's more of a suggestion rather than a rule. But .org lends, the extension lends a lot of credibility to whatever information is on there. Oh, this must be very official. Very simple. Annuity. Dot org. But what happens, it's a marketing organization and they have several contributors who write the content and I don't know how it does and I'm not picking on any of those people individually, but I saw it as a nonpartisan, nonprofit type extension, but that's just my opinion. You guys can tell me what you think. So I was recently told by some guys that are working on my website and helping me index my information so it's more readily available and easier to find for people. They sent it to me and said, oh, these guys have done a really good job at search engine optimization. Was something you guys don't care about, but you should because you want to make sure that when you type in a question, you get the answer you're looking for. It becomes harder and harder to do it because what you get is chosen by the search engine based on a set of algorithmic rules and it just goes through the search and finds. So when you search fixed indexed annuities, I haven't gone through all their pages. These guys are likely to pop up. You're going to get some of your information there. I was told that they're a good example of someone who's done it the right way and is ranked very high in search results. So I checked it out and I thought, Man, I read like the first three paragraphs. I'm like, that's not right. So I'm going to show you guys this. And this is the type of thing that you're going to see. And you have to use common sense. And again, don't believe me over them. Use logic and understand that this is not how they work. So I'm going to give you several examples that are going to be on the newsletter. And you guys can see it for anybody who's watching the video right now. First quote, like any other type of annuity, fixed index annuities came with, come with fees and commissions that must be paid on top of the initial premium. The more complex an annuity is, the more expensive the fees and commissions tend to be. That is wildly inaccurate. A baseline fixed index annuity does not have fees. It's a spread product. Insurance companies buy bonds take a spread and give you the remaining interest, which is what's used to build the index annuity. Fees come with additional riders. I've explained this in detail in a newsletter. Haven't done a podcast all about annuity fees. Link's going to be in the newsletter. Okay. Commissions are paid on several products, but not all products. There are fee-based products that don't pay a commission where an investment advisor might take a management fee from those. But most of the products are commission-based products. It's not paid on top of the premium. It's factored into the cost of the annuity, internally calculated, and it does not come out of your pocket. That's where you get surrender charges from, surrender schedules, all that kind of stuff. It's a built-in cost to the contract, but is not paid on top of the premium you pay. Eh, that's false. Okay. Ooh. Next one. Fixed index annuities are best suited for investors who don't need the money right away. According to annuity.org expert Chip, whatever his name is, fixed index annuities are most beneficial for investors with 10 to 15 years before they'll need income because they'll have time to weather any downturns that might reduce the annuity's return. 
I don't know anybody I've ever sold an index annuity to that waited 10 or 15 years to use it. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Lots of people buy them when they retire, while they're retired. Lots of people use money in the first year. Some of them wait a couple years. Never seen anybody wait 10 to 15 years. I've sold some a few years ago, five, six years ago to people who plan to wait 10 years, but they're not required to. A couple of contracts mandate that. We've talked about those in the past. This is not a product specific page, but that is a ridiculous piece of advice from somebody who's supposed to be a financial advisor. Next one, because fixed index annuities are invested in equity market indexes, they are, there are fees associated with maintaining those investments. These include mortality expenses, investment expense ratios, which can range from 0.5 to 1.5 and from 0.6 to over 3% respectively. Complete BS. That is a variable annuity explanation. Mortality and expense fees only exist on variable annuities. And what they do is they guarantee the initial premium is available as a death benefit. That's why it's called mortality and expense. If you die and the market dropped, your heirs are going to get back the initial premium. That does not apply to fixed index annuities because the principal balance is not at risk. There are not fees associated with maintaining investments in the equity markets. They are not attached to the equity markets. That's the spread we talked about. That's what the company uses to administer the, con the contracts. That's what they make. And then you've got the interest earnings on those investments to get credit to do the contract that are used to purchase index options. And within those index options would be the fees. That's an internal calculation that has nothing to do with that. That is very, a very misplaced comment. And if you're reading this, and you look at it, a lot of people see that and say, oh, fees, what about fees? I've talked about it extensively. They don't exist. Okay, pros and cons. They've got a uh, little blurb on that. Tax deferred growth, sure. On the pros, may hedge against inflation. Eh, that's not a concrete example. <clears throat> Rates are often better than CDs. Not really because they're not guaranteed to grow. They're, they're indexed to the market. If the market drops and you get a 0% on your return, then... <clears throat> It didn't grow and a CD was better, right? The cons, gains are capped. Not all gains are capped. Some of them are. And sometimes it's beneficial to use the cap when the market doesn't grow a whole lot. But there are participation rates and margins that give you uncapped returns. Lack of fee transparency. Eh, it's com clearly stated in the contract. There are no fees on a base contract. A very few of them. <clears throat> Might have an annual contract fee, 75 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever. But I only seen one or two of those out of maybe five or 600 that are available. Any fees are typically very clearly disclosed, and those only relate to additional benefits or riders that you want to put on the contract. High sales commissions. Those may exist on some products, but it's not a con of the contract itself. If the contract itself doesn't work, then someone who doesn't buy it because of how much commission it might pay is not focusing on the benefit for them. If you focus on the benefit for you, so that's a very subjective thing to throw in there and say it. Now, some people want, might want to you know, consider that, and it's supposed to be disclosed at the point of sale, <clears throat> but... High sales commission is not a negative of the annuity itself. Steep surrender charges, again, very vague. Oh, steep surrender charges. It's an emotional tag on it that doesn't explain. You're talking about surrender charges being a con of annuity, of fixed index annuities. Um, that's all well and good, but again, understand where it comes from. Is it a con or is it not? Because you're not paying a sales load, you're not paying a fee, the insurance company has cost to administer that. Again, okay, maybe call that a con, but I think it's put in there to elicit an emotional response. 
Uh, cap on increasing value may be reduced in later years of the contract. I've detailed that as well. Index annuity rate changes. It's a reality because of options pricing and reinvestment of bonds within the contract, declining interest rates possibly over the term. Again, I would consider that okay to mention it. I think it is one of those things, hey, what happens? And to understand first and foremost, why it might happen, why it might not. But I think that list of pros and cons, milk toast, honestly. It's, it's not that material, a lot of emotional stuff in there. There's a pro tip, right? Next one, with a fixed index annuity, the number of payments to the annuity holder may increase if a predetermined stock index performs well. It's hard to explain this, but we're talking about traditional annuity payments that might be indexed, and that would be like a period certain, like a 20-year payment stream, where hey, if the index performs well, that is so specific, a contract, a type of contract. I only know of a couple, I've only looked at a couple that used to exist. I think when rates went really low, they didn't do it anymore. But that is not just a fixed indexed annuity. That is an income annuity that might have a fixed index component to the payout rate. So to state that as a pro tip, it's Bush League, to be honest with you. It confuses the situ situation. I've not met, met one person who needed one of those annuities or was interested in one. So to have general information, hey, here's your pro tip. Doesn't make sense. The next one, fixed index annuities come with a moderate level of risk due to their indirect market participation, but some protections do exist at the federal and state levels for annuity customers. We're not even really supposed to talk about the state protections. I don't know of any federal protections uh, unless it's a variable annuity, but they're talking about fixed index annuities. There are no federal protections for it completely misleading and incorrect state levels yes there are i've talked extensively about why that is irrelevant to most contracts if per purchased for the right reasons from a respectable company there's no moderate level of risk to the premium itself there's no additional risk to the insurance company for a fixed index annuity it's an opportunity cost they're only spending the fixed earnings that is available in a fixed annuity so that is completely inaccurate as well. Hmm. Next one. When state departments are made aware of financially unstable insurance companies, they may notify the State Guarantee Association, the nonprofit organization that protects policyholders by paying the claims of customers when an insurance sure in that state becomes insolvent. That is not at all how it works, and it's not as cut and dry as that. It's not, oh, this company's unstable. Tell the guarantee fund to bail it out. No, they've got to liquidate the company. They try to rehabilitate it. I've talked about this a lot. I've got probably three newsletters, two podcasts talking about insurance company failure. It's not as cut and dry in that, as, as that. And that is definitely, I can't even give you a definition, but at least I'm willing to say that. And they put that on there. Oh, nonprofit organization that protects policyholders. You should never bank on that for buying any annuity. And for them to state that, is irresponsible because that's not how it happens. Real quick, I told the story about Executive Life in New York. There's definitely a podcast for this. It would be beneficial. I took them 23 years to get this to the state guarantee associations. So I've talked to other people who had small companies failed. Their money's locked up for three or four years. It's not just a phone call. Hey, pay it out. It's not like the FDIC. It's true insurance. So they've got to work through the process of selling off the company, rehabilitating it if at all possible, bleeding out reserves, liquidating everything. It takes a while. Okay. Silliness. Okay. What are the advantages and disadvantages? The advantages of fixed index annuities include the potential to earn more interest and the premium protection they offered. The dif disadvantages include higher fees and commissions and caps on gains. Base contracts do not have fees. You don't pay a commission if you want to pay a management fee, but not all contracts pay high commissions and not all gains are capped. Again, you can have an opinion that's the case, but do not state it as fact. And that's what it's done here. It's stating it as fact, but it's an opinion. And it's a very general opinion that can be picked apart from a lot of different angles. 
Okay, next one. A balanced retirement portfolio requires a mix of assets with varying degrees of risk. Because fixed index annuities are inherently balanced, having features of both fixed and variable annuities, these products can be included in a portfolio without skewing asset allocation. They do not have elements of variable annuities. Variable annuities are variable. Fixed index annuities are not variable. And they say it a lot, and that is certainly not the case. As far as portfolio balance, okay, sure. That's a reasonable stance to take. Fixed index annuities are not as safe as fixed annuities, but they are safer than variable annuities. Wrong. They are just as safe as fixed annuities because they're invested in the same assets. The only difference is the return you can expect. A fixed annuity gives you a guaranteed rate of return. And the index annuity depends on an external index moving up. If it goes down, you're safe. They're just as safe as index annuity or as fixed annuities. Uh, and they're wildly different than variable annuities because variable annuities are not safe. So that's a list of them. I think I missed one in there that I wanted to talk about. And I don't see it, so I'm not quite sure where it went. But that's okay. Anyhow, when you look at something like this, Kind of the way I look at it is, is I make mistakes and I've been corrected in certain cases and I'm happy to offer a statement. If I need to be corrected, it gives me a chance to learn something. But if I come out and offer outright false information as fact, it completely discredits everything else I do. That's why I've got to fix it if I'm wrong. I've done that before. I have typos. Again, this is just me. Yeah, sometimes my finger hits the wrong key while I'm typing and I'm moving so fast that I don't notice it. But to my knowledge, everything on my website is completely fair and accurate. And if I'm wrong about something, I will offer a correction and I'll state it publicly. So I don't know what these guys are doing. Again, going back to it, it's a company that they're getting your name, email, phone number, maybe your assets and all this stuff. And they're selling your name to advisors. So their job is if they can get you to come there for 50 bucks and fill out your information, they're going to sell it to another advisor for two, 300 bucks, right? That's their business model is just find your name, sell it and make money. That's why you get a lot of those advisors that work so dang hard to sell something because they've got to make it worthwhile. They buy 20 names, you spend five or 6,000 bucks, right? You got to sell X amount of annuities to get your money back. And we're all in this to make it, make a buck too. So that happens as well. I remember doing uh, a similar lead generation thing, I filled out a form with my assets looking for investment advisors. And the goal at the time was to find local advisors in my area and talk to them about business ideas. And I filled out all the information and I got hit from three local advisors. And to this day, one of them, we have a really good relationship and we refer stuff back and forth to each other. But they sold my name to three people. I asked him. I took him to lunch the first day. I said, hey, listen, I'm sorry. I know it costs you money to get my name, but I'll buy lunch. And after, I'll make sure it's worthwhile to you. And I said, how much did it cost? He said, they charged me 250 bucks. I filled out the form. They sold it to three people. That company that did it made $750. I'm not going to mention that company because this isn't about them. But I do know that company is held out there as a very reputable organization that has a network of highly qualified investment advisors. No, they're not. They're just selling leads. Okay. Careful where you get your information from. You want to get it from the horse's mouth. That's right here. AnnuityStraightTalk.com. Had a hundred episodes. This is the one we're going to start and we're going to keep going and doing what we do to answer questions. Keep it straight. Keep it truthful. There's more stuff on that website. I haven't gone. Uh, there's more things. I think I left a few things out, but this is good enough. And I hope you guys get the idea. There's a lot of credibility and like I said, it's just put my feet to the fire. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. I'm happy to change it. So anyway, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who's stuck with me the whole way. A lot of people watched a lot of episodes. Some people have claimed and say they've listened to every single one. It's been fun to do it. And I appreciate communicating with you guys this way and helping everybody with retirement. My goal is to make sure that this podcast is effective and helps people figure out how to discern between truth and fiction. That's as simple as it gets. I'm not trying to sell you an annuity. Maybe you want one. Maybe I got what you need. Maybe I don't. But again, the goal is to be good at what I do and to put out good information 
I've done it for 100 episodes now. I'm going to do it for 100 more and probably more after that. So thank you again for joining me. Look forward to uh, the next century, episode 101 next week. My name is Brian Anderson. Go ahead and schedule a call. Top right corner of annuitystraighttalk.com. Send this off to your friends. Like, subscribe, comment, share podcast platforms or on YouTube. And I'm here if you need me, schedule an appointment. We'll get after it and help you figure things out. Enjoy the weekend. And I will see you next week with episode 101. Okay, thank you. Bye. You have been listening to Annuity Straight Talk. The preceding information is for informational and educational purposes only and does not represent tax, legal, or investment advice. The views expressed by guests on this program are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Annuity Straight Talk or its partners. No information presented today should be acted upon without meeting with a qualified and licensed professional. It is important that you read all insurance contract disclosures carefully before making a purchase decision. Guarantees are based on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the insurance company.